You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. Um, my guest is Katie Hansen. She's a PhD. She writes, speaks, researches, and teaches about the social and political aspects of human genetic and reproductive technologies. Um, she's part of the, uh, the Center for Genetics and Society, and uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, thorny but interesting issues. So, Katie, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me, what, what's, your, uh, what's your work about? What are you focused on? Yeah, well, let me tell you a little bit about the Center for Genetics and Society. Um, we're a public interest nonprofit. We're based in Berkeley, California. And what we're focused on is um, trying to encourage responsible uses and effective governance of human genetic and assisted reproductive technologies. And within that, um, a main focus that we have is trying to bring a social justice perspective to public conversations around human biotechnologies. Um, and here I'm the program director on genetic justice. Um, my main focus is in our work around human gene editing um, and, okay. and really focused on how we can bring more perspectives and more voices um, into the really urgent conversations that we need to be having as a society about how we want to use a powerful biotechnology like human gene editing. So what's the... Uh... What is the justice part of it? Like, you know, well, I guess first, how is it being used today? How, what, what's the fears around the use in the near future? Let's start with that. Yeah. Um, so there, there's been conversations about how we should use human gene editing that have gone on for a long time, right? Really since, um, you know, the early 2000s, uh, back when the conversation was more around human cloning. Um, but in the past few years with the emergence um, of CRISPR and the different ways of using CRISPR gene editing, these conversations have really um, gotten much uh, more prevalent and, and much more important. Um, and there are a range of ways that uh, CRISPR and other forms of gene editing can be used on humans. And I think there's a really important distinction to make right off the bat, which is um, about whether we're talking about using gene editing um, in somatic cells, right, in uh, the body of an actual patient to um, attempt to treat or perhaps uh, cure an illness that they have, but this would be something that um, affects the cells in their bodies but um, is not passed on to future generations. So we call that somatic gene editing or gene therapy. Um, and the distinction is between that and germline gene editing, which is um, using CRISPR or another gene editing tool on uh, sperm or eggs or early embryos in a way that would make changes that would be um, throughout every cell in that person's body and also pass on to future generations. Um, so on the one hand, for gene therapies, we're talking about developing treatments for, um, for actual patients. And uh, germline gene editing, we're talking about affecting the genetic makeup or perhaps the traits of, of future people, future generations. Um, and that's something that uh, for a long time, many people have believed should really be a, a bright line that we don't cross with how we use these technologies. But um, probably you and your, your listeners have heard um, in November of last year, there was an announcement uh, by a scientist in China, Zhang Kui, 
who announced that he that there had been the birth of um, two babies whose genes had been edited in the embryo stage, right? So this was the announcement of the first CRISPR babies or, or genetically edited babies. And this has really, um, you know, um, intensified and, and sped up the conversations that we need to have about, about how we'll be using um, these technologies. Some of the concerns are, you know, um, I mean, there are a number of uh, technical and safety concerns. This is pretty new research, and I don't think um, really any scientists agree that it's the right time to move forward with using this in human beings. There are just too many unknowns. Um, we know about some of the ways that it can go wrong. Uh, CRISPR can make off-target cuts. It can make changes where it's not supposed to, or it can um, make the wrong kinds of changes at the target site. Um, there are cases where not all of the cells are um, edited so that the resulting person would have a, a mix of cells that are edited and not edited, and we don't know, you know, what, what the effects of that would um, be on their health. And really, we just, we, we don't know in a lot of ways what the effects would be um, once a baby is born, as they grow up, as they grow older, you know, as this moves into the next generation. Um, and it's not clear that there's really an ethical way that we can find out, right? How could we really say um, that we know that this is safe and ready to be used in people? Um, but beyond those, those safety concerns, there are a lot of um, social concerns. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, we are most concerned about here. Um, <clears throat> so what's, what's an example of uh, some social concerns? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when, when we think about the proponents, people who want to go ahead with, um, with using germline gene editing, uh, the conversation is often around um, preventing disease, right? preventing genetic diseases from being passed on to future generations. Um, and one of the things that's frustrating about that conversation is that it often doesn't include a lot of the alternatives that already exist. Many people support the goal of you know, for parents who know that they're at risk of um, passing on a genetic disease to their offspring, uh, many people support helping them um, prevent that from happening. But, but we actually already have um, safe and effective ways of doing that when, um, when that seems like an appropriate goal, um, particularly through embryo screening um, or a process called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where uh, parents could use IVF and screen the IVF embryos that they have and, and choose to only implant those that are not affected by the disorder um, that they're concerned about passing on. And that's something that would um, be effective in the, in the vast majority of cases, although there are, are some where it wouldn't happen. But um, so when we're talking about the, the benefits and harms, it's, it's important to think about the alternatives that are already available. So yeah, okay. What are some of the ethical considerations? So people say they want to, um, you know, they want to eradicate these diseases that could be inherited. But um, I don't know. What are other reasons for people to do what they want to do? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, even even that basic question isn't entirely um, free free of ethical concerns, especially if we look at it from um, a disability rights uh, perspective. There are many people. Um, Disabled people, people in the disability rights community, who um, who argue that that the disability actually comes from the way that society um, treats people with a with a variety of embodiments, um, and that we shouldn't necessarily assume that um, that all of these things need to be fixed. Many people think of um, a disability as, as part of their identity, even, and so I think that's one thing to keep in mind, even when we're talking about screening or, or PGD. Um, but a, a level of societal concern comes in um, when we think about uh, who's going to make decisions about how these technologies can be used, right? There's, there's not um, agreement across the board on, you know, what, um, what counts as a serious disease or where we would draw the line between um, something that was seen as um, having a therapeutic aim or something that is seen as um, 
designed to, to enhance um, the future person, right? And so uh, there's not full agreement on that, and it brings up the question of how we would decide, um, you know, how this would be used in the future. Um, and there really are a number of risks of these technologies um, if germline gene editing were to be used in reproductive contexts, right, to change future generations. Um, that it would exacerbate the kinds of social inequalities that we already have in our society um, that are already, you know, quite vast. Um, and we have to think about uh, how we um, want to, like, do we want to embark on the use of this new technology that could make those inequalities even worse, right, by <clears throat> allowing those with, um, with wealth to have access to purported enhancements, right, even if um, it's not possible to uh, produce the kinds of genetic enhancements of intelligence or um, appearance or athletics that, that often get talked about when the idea of designer babies is brought up, right? Even if it's not possible to, to make those kinds of um, changes genetically, uh, the idea that, um, that you could, right, it's, um, it's very likely that clinics would advertise these forms of enhancement to parents and parents who had um, attempted to have these edits made to their children um, would, would perhaps see their children differently. Um, educators might see them differently, right? The perception that there was some kind of enhancement and the belief that some people in society would be um, genetically enhanced can be very damaging, that we can see that from, you know, the history of uh, racism and of eugenics in our society that are, that are based around this basic belief that there are forms of biological superiority. Well, okay. Is, is the concern more to get therapies into people's hands or is the concern to uh, limit the possibility of people being enhanced? What if a therapy is both? Well, you know, therapies that would be for for patients, but these kinds of somatic gene therapies are something that most people support, right? The idea of of stopping um, germline gene editing is is not to um, stop any forms of therapies uh, in terms of somatic gene therapies. So I think many people support that going ahead as long as there's you know full attention paid to making sure that they're safe and they're effective and that they're accessible to people, right? The, the gene therapies that already exist are, are astoundingly expensive. Um, and so there has to be some thought put into um, how those will be paid for and, and how we can make sure that, that everyone who needs them has access to them. And the question of enhancement definitely will come into play with the uh, somatic gene therapies. And that's something that, that probably needs to be discussed more, right? How are we going to um, make sure that these therapies are developed and, um, and decide which uses will be allowed and which won't? But I think because, you know, we're talking in that case about only that individual um, and the, the risks and benefits that might come to that person, um, it's a very different question than whether we're going to allow people to you know, alter the genes of, of future generations and in ways that could be, you know, passed on. Say someone, I'm just going to put it bluntly, you know, a couple can't get pregnant. So the only way to help them is, though, this one therapy that would change not just their somatic cells, but it would change their germline cells, you know, the egg of the sperm, in order to allow them to have a baby, which is fine for that instance. But then going forward, every time they have a baby, they would be able to, I mean, I guess I don't know what what the uh, what would be the conundrum on doing that. Mm. I mean, I think I mean, the the conundrum is partly about you know making these changes with unknown effects um, that could be passed down, right? We won't we won't know what you know what the um, risks may turn out to be in in those future generations. And I think um, you know there's I guess there's I guess there's two kinds. You know, let's, let's say. Um, you can tell that the uh, you know the child you're going to have is going to have Down syndrome, so you alter them so that they're quote unquote I guess back to normal. Versus uh, the child, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you restore things back to their normal state, that's one thing. But if you change things that affect the normal state, so it's different from the normal state. There, it seems like it would be a lot more of a question of, hmm, you know, we changed this, but how does it affect everything else versus just 
fixing an obvious defect you can see? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, there are, I mean, I would, I would reject, I would not take that as a, as an assumption. Um, you know, I think that there, it is a part of normal variation for, for someone to have Down syndrome or to have a, a number of different kinds of embodiment. And, um, you know, when you start um, talking about just putting, um, only returning things to what's normal, I mean, that, <clears throat> there's a lot of assumptions that go into, um, you know, saying what is normal. And, um, you know, it comes back to this question of, one, you know, who decides that, especially when there is such broad disagreement. I mean, there are many people um, with a range of disabilities who, you know, feel that this really would increase discrimination against them in society to, to say that it should just be edited out, the condition that they have and that makes up an important part of who they are. Um, but also, the, it, <clears throat> it sounds easier on the face of it to say, well, these kinds of interventions would be therapeutic and these would be enhancement. But it gets much trickier when you start to um, drill down into what that would look like. Whereas the, the line between, you know, somatic therapies that only affect that one person and germline that affects future generations is an, is an easier line to draw. But, you know, when you talk about, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, correcting disease, it opens up the question of what about something like prevention or what about something that would um, reduce someone's likelihood of getting a disease by a certain percentage. Can we call that purely therapy? Can we call that enhancement? Um, and, and how are we going to make enforceable policy around a, a slippery distinction like that? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, I mean, all medicine itself, if I help someone with a condition they have, why could you say that's enhancement? You know, if someone has a cold, you could say that's natural, and I gave them something to cure them of the cold, so are they enhanced? And is that unjust that I help them? I mean, I think that's, you know, one kind of question, but I think it becomes different when, you, when you're talking about, um, you know, altering oh, DNA or a move it into a different kind of category than, you know, the example of um, eyeglasses that, uh, that improve people's vision um, or something like that. Maybe. I mean, I guess you could say anything, like, you know, could be like that. Why should they be allowed to have eyeglasses and have enhanced vision when other people don't have them? But I know there's, there's going like way far afield and then there's stuff that's more obvious. So mm -hmm. I understand there's going to be questions around a lot of stuff. Yeah. But if someone has a condition where the average lifespan of them is going to be a third of what, what would normally happen or what's mm -hmm. average and they'd be in horrible pain and have disability, well, maybe that seems like more of an obvious thing. You know, maybe cystic fibrosis, there's really no argument on it. It's, mm -hmm. a, you know, it seems to be a horrible condition. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone that would, would want to keep it. So, I, you know, but there are questions around all this stuff. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, sort of pushing to, to make a list of, of what wouldn't. wouldn't um, You're going to have to, yeah. Someone's going to have to, it sounds like. Well, I mean, but I think there is a choice that we could say, you know, let's focus on somatic therapies for people, you know, who are here and who have um, illnesses that, would like to be treated. Let's, you know, if we decide it's appropriate, let's use the kinds of um, screening that we have, like PGD with IVF, when parents know that they're at risk of passing something on to their children. But, but let's not move into um, intervening in the germline. Do you think it's even controllable, or is this just, you know, yeah, we'd like to control it, but I don't know if it's even possible. What are your thoughts? Do you think it's controllable? I mean, I, I, I don't think that it's. You know, we can't throw our hands up and say it's inevitable, it's going to happen anyway. I mean, well, there, there, there are many countries that already have legislation that say that um, germline gene editing should be prohibited. And, and it's um, having more international cooperation and laws would, would really go a long way towards um, having a clear stance out there, right? I mean, the, you know, even having laws prohibiting germline gene editing everywhere would not stop every case of it happening, right? I mean, that's unrealistic, but having the law sends a clear message about, you know, what we think should and should not be allowed and, you know, has 
can have penalties attached to it for people who violate it. Um, mm. So it couldn't be stopped in 100% of cases. I mean, we've already seen that that's true, but um, it's not the case then that we, you know, could not collectively decide to have legislation about it, right? We, we have laws for many things that do get broken, but we don't get rid of or say that there's no point in having laws about it. Right, I got you. Yeah. So you think a good line initially would be uh, somatic versus germline alterations? Yeah, yeah. I think that that is um, the one that, you know, conceptually and practically the easiest one to hold. Um, and somatic gene therapies do offer a lot of promise, so it's, you know, it's good to keep that exploration going. Okay, gotcha. So what's the, I mean, I don't know, is there an international organization that's going to uh, make these rules? It sounds like there should be one. Mm. You know, if you want it to be all around the world. So what's, yeah, what's happening I mean, worldwide? Are, are bodies forming or who's running them? Or what's, what's kind of the state of the Yeah. I, I mean, there are, you know, as I said, there are a number of, of countries where on the national level they've made legislation. Um, and there is at least one international treaty um, called the, the Oviedo Convention. It's from the Council of Europe. Um, and at least 29 countries have, have ratified that. And, it, you know, it says that, that germline gene editing for reproduction um, would be, is prohibited. Um, and then there are a number of uh, international efforts to talk about how this should be regulated. There's a panel that's meeting through the World Health Organization currently, and there's a, um, a, an international commission hosted jointly by the National Academy of Sciences in the US and the Royal Society in the UK that's pulled together members from a number of countries to, to think about what a framework um, for using germline gene editing might look like uh, if society decides that it, it should go forward. The, the WHO panel is looking more broadly at you know, what, um, what should be done. So those are two efforts that are going on. But you know, we would really like to see um, an even broader conversation. I mean, this is something we're, that we're talking about that could potentially affect everybody, right? If we're talking about um, altering the human genome in future generations in ways that would be passed down and become a part of um, sort of the, the general gene pool, um, then it's something that, that affects all humans, basically, all of us. Um, and so it would really be something that, you know, there should be a way for uh, the broadest possible um, conversation to happen, to bring more people in, more voices. Um, so far, the conversations are mainly happening um, among, you know, elite scientists, bioethics professionals, sometimes broader groups of academics, but we'd really like to see more of a public conversation happening, um, and <clears throat> in particular, one that brings in voices from civil society, like groups that are already thinking and talking and working on um, you know, issues of uh, discrimination in our society and ways to repair it will have a particular um, unique perspective on these questions and I think should be, um, should be brought into the conversation as well. Well, voices and talks and, and liber you know, again, is this just in the U.S. or is this worldwide? And, you know, what's the focus here? First here and then worldwide? I mean, we can rule on X, Y, and Z, but if uh, other countries don't rule the same, you know, then what? Right. So how would you, you know, how would you make this a phenomenon that actually would be enforceable? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it really does need to be um, worldwide, which will obviously be a challenge, but, you know, it's, it's an important enough question that we should sort of put the, the time and creativity into thinking about how we could um, make it happen. But a number of um, scientists and organizations have already been calling for a worldwide moratorium on reproductive uses of germline gene editing. So the idea that we say, let's stop for now so that we have time to have these conversations in a really thorough, um, broad way, right? So we can figure out how we can bring in people around the world, how we can um, make sure that there's international cooperation um, in these rules. But if, if you know, scientists are racing to move ahead, we lose time to have that conversation. Whereas saying, let's um, let's stop for now while we decide uh, really gives, a, gives more space and time for that to take place, right? It is a, it is a complicated question how we will um, 
uh, come up with a way uh, that is actually, you know, worldwide and cooperative and enforceable. Um, but we'll need uh, some time to think about it, to work it out. What's the path there that you see? With you know, with the what are the steps right now that you guys are taking to try to get this moving? Yeah, um, I mean, we are. You know, one of the things that we do is we work with other organizations. Um, we work with reproductive justice organizations, disability rights, LGBTQ environmental groups, um, and a number of others to sort of bring this issue to them and kind of bring their perspectives more to the public. Um, we are um, interested in things like the, the U.S. Senate resolution that was introduced um, earlier this year uh, that <clears throat> that called for broad public um, debate and at least was bringing um, the the attention of the Senate of the Senate and of our elected leaders to this issue in a way that encourages international cooperation and and broad conversation in the public um, so those are those are two promising things. Um, we okay. would like to see the, the efforts that are already underway, like the WHO and the, and the National Academies of Science um, groups, to, to have a more kind of robust um, uh, public conversation around that as well. Now, for listeners, how can they get involved in the conversation and how can they find out more? Yeah, um, you know, our website, geneticsandsociety.org. Uh, has a lot of information. We, um, you know, follow the news very closely, and we post a lot of news. We have uh, writing on our blog, which is called Biopolitical Times. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at c underscore g underscore s, and you can find us on Facebook as well. Uh, you can also join our email list and get our monthly newsletter. Okay, excellent. So best is uh, go to the website or go on social media, and then in the show notes. We'll put details about the meeting that's coming up in a few weeks. And uh, excellent. Well, Katie, right. thank you for coming. Oh, yeah. Thank you for uh, your time. Thank you for the conversation. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, but we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.